Hello. Good morning, everyone. So, Jacqueline, Singapore wants to be the leading AI-powered economy in the world. That's a tall order for a small country. Tell us how you plan to do that. Thanks a lot, Aisha. <laughs> I'm not an expert in AI. Uh, a long time ago, when I was uh, uh, running GovTech, I did a little bit of practical AI for citizens. Um, so I've got a little experience on that and the kind of impact it has on productivity and jobs. But here in my role in the Economic Development Board, uh, we work very closely with organizations like the Ministry of Digital Development and Information, as well as IMDA, the Infocom Media uh, Authority, uh, and the National AI Office uh, in the furtherance of our AI objectives. The reason I say that Singapore is more interested in being the most AI-powered economy in the world, as opposed to the economy that has the most data centers uh, with GPUs in them, or the economy that has the most um, LLMs, uh, or foundational models, uh, or sovereign foundational models, is because this is a choice that we've taken. Um, we believe that you know, AI has a huge transformative uh, potential for the economy, and we think that we've seen this before, because when we started Smart Nation and we decided on a digital economy, um, we wanted to reach into every facet of the economy to be able to use digital to improve products and to improve productivity. That journey's taken more than 10, 15 years now, and we're actually really seeing the fruits of that happen. The digital economy in Singapore is close to about 17, 20% of GDP now. If you include not just the verticals and the companies in the ICT verticals, but also the ones in the rest of the economy. And that's really possible to do also with AI. But it's gonna take a lot of effort. It's gonna take a lot of talent. It's going to take compute. And most of all, it's gonna take companies willing to change their business models, their operating processes, the way they engineer data, uh, and the way they provide um, experiences to their customers in order to actually make that happen. So like I say, we've done it before with digitalization. We think we can do it with AI, but not, not easily. 74% uh, or sorry, 84% of Singapore companies say they can't really uh, implement AI as effectively as they would like to simply because their data is found in too many silos. Many of them say they can't get the talent they need uh, in order to be able to implement simply the kind of data engineering and the integration of solutions uh, from what is actually uh, still a very evolving AI stack. Uh, and it's evolving all over the world. And so these are the kind of questions uh, that we work with various companies um, to make happen. We work with two types of companies. The ones that are at the edge, in other words, the ones that are most ambitious, in terms of the implementation of AI. And for that, we're looking for 100 companies who want to put up AI centers of excellence in Singapore. And these include companies that are born on the internet like Grab. Uh, there are companies like have huge amounts of data and operations processes like the Changi Airport or the Port of Singapore. And they're ones in the sectors that we think are the most promising sectors for AI to flourish because they have the data and because they have the use cases and problem statements. And these include sectors such as financial services. Mm -hmm. They work with companies like DBS and other companies uh, like uh, Prudential, for example, uh, to actually implement AI in their, uh, in their various processes, including fraud detection and customer service. There are companies in healthcare. We think healthcare has a huge potential and there's such a huge range uh, of uh, implementation and use cases in healthcare. We're doing AI for drug discovery on the one hand, but we're also looking at AI in operations processes in pharmaceutical manufacturing plants. And then there's AI in the healthcare deliver delivery system, you know, literally the hospitals, the clinics, and really how AI is delivered to each patient. And there are other areas as well. For example, advanced manufacturing. Not many people realize, but Singapore is not just a services hub. Singapore is not just a business hub. Singapore has 20% of its GDP in manufacturing. We make stuff. <laughs> and that means that there's a lot of potential for what we call uh, AI in industrial, you know, a sort of industry 4.0 processes, industrial AI uh, to, make, to actually make manufacturing more productive. 
Uh, and then finally, there's a whole range of professional services, which is done in Singapore, legal, accounting, and so on, for which I think AI makes a huge amount of sense to be implemented uh, in their uh, work streams. Um, so to, this, together with supply chain logistics, uh, presents a huge opportunity uh, for Singapore to be the world's most AI-powered nation. I love it. So Jacqueline just laid out our vision and the use case that, Sushan, can you give me some real examples of successes and failures on the ground? Is this possible, what Jacqueline is saying? So, by the way, if these two ladies tell you they're not AI experts, don't believe them. <laughs> but like, like everyone in the room, and frankly anyone um, you know, operating in business, we're all learning as we, we, we go. Right? And, and so my perspective is whether it's the customer or the employee, you know, the, 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 the key is to encourage experimentation, allow failure, get the feedback, and then keep improving and learning and changing and saying, oh my God, that worked, that didn't work, and being brutally honest with ourselves and allowing leaders to say, oops, that was a fail, right? And, and, and then us doing the post-mortem and diagnosing why one model worked and one didn't work. So I think the, the, the beauty of AI is the ability to scale experimentation. Um, and, and it then behoves all of us businesses, to Jack's point, to make sure our data is organized. And the beauty of Gen AI is, guess what? It helps with unstructured and structured data, so you can do both. Um, and um, and, and for, for, for us at DBS, um, I'll share the, both the internal and the external perspective. So the internal perspective was how do you move 30 to 40,000 employees into this new way of working? Not easy. Well, you have to behave like a startup, but you're really a very mature company. So how do you do that? Right, so one of the things we did which really worked was we use gamification. We use video games, right? So in 2020, we did this, this thing called Deep Racer with AWS, and that was just, hey, you can teach your, your, your Formula One virtual car how to drive with machine learning, uh, machine learning. So you don't need to code. You just need to learn how to tell it to go right, to go left, see a wall, crash, learn from that wall, it's there. Turn right when you see that wall in future. And so, I, 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 I was one of like, I don't know, 5,000 employees that learned you know, to, to, to build my own fast car using machine learning. And that then made me understand, ah, you know, you can cut and paste code to make your model better and faster, and, and you can do this really quickly. So that was for us an aha moment. Then, you know, being able to bring all the customer data, we've got 15,000 customer points for certain use cases. Uh, we've rolled it out to three and a half million customers in, 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 in the consumer banking side. Um, and then refining the model. Because, you know, if you've been doing the same job for a long time, you think you know it all. But the data might tell you something else, right? So one of the use cases I, I, I like to cite is, um, you know, you all know that the FX rates and interest rates have been very volatile. And time and time again, your bankers will come and say, we got to cut, you know, you got to discount this or cut this because some startups come up with a lower price or a, a better price or whatever. And okay, but let's, let's experiment. Let's try some use cases where the prices are lower. Let's try some use cases where the message is different. Sometimes it's all about the how, not the, the who and the what. Where the who and the what you know, but the how. How do you message? the offer. The offer could be, hey, we've got a great way to click here. The offer could be, oh, I've missed you, haven't seen you in a while. Come back and do this trade for us and we'll give you something, right? Hey, guess which one worked better? <laughs> the I miss you message actually worked better. So, you know, so we all have our embedded biases, unconscious bias. But being able to have these AI machine learning models then tell you otherwise can be quite a humbling experience <laughs> for many of us. But then we learn, we go, okay, which is why now we manage by dashboards. Every meeting we have internally now, we have a live dashboard. And so if the manager says, no, we got a discount, be like, okay, sure. Let's, let's have a look at, at what the feedback loop tells us. Right? So the, the discipline that we now have is you must always have a feedback loop. Right? So then if you're a product owner, and, and we now organize by horizontals, right? horizontal organizations. So in, in, in every customer 
um, every customer journey, the horizontal organization comes together, and everyone is incentivized by the same outcomes. We want great customer experience. We want them to give us a five-star click. We want you know, successes. We want new clients to come on, new to product, new to, to bank, et cetera. And if everyone is incentivized for the common outcomes and everyone owns the failures together, right? So that's a real cultural mindset shift. Mm -hmm. And then when you manage by dashboards, it's pretty instant and the data doesn't lie. So then you, you can say, okay, look, right, let's look at the data, what the customer's telling us, what the feedback loop tells us, and keep refining and refining and refining and learning as you get along. So it's, it's, it's a journey um, and, and it is a mindset, cultural mindset shift. But I think you can, the human brain is so agile, right? So you can change an old hag like me to become you know, more of a machine learning, AI-driven individual. You can change anyone. And, and, and what's really inspired me is, 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 is we have got people who've worked in the service center, call center for 30 years, people who used to be bank tellers for 30 years, and they are the ones helping us with the model making. And that, to me, is, 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 is what it's all about. It's, it's getting both your, your, your stakeholders, your internal stakeholders, and your external stakeholders, because you need them to tell you, hey, I like this, or I don't like this. I often say it's a fine line between being relevant and being creepy, <laughs> right? And, and, and so being, you know, bringing these stakeholders together and what they see works for them so that you can hyper-personalize to a point of N equals one. I think, Sushan, listening to you, it's so reassuring that real results and real implementation. Because if I compare this to the media and the news, there's so much hype, Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. Like on the one hand, you have DBS really using it in all these different ways and admitting to experimentation and failures and successes. But then there's multi-billion dollar valuations. What do you think, Jacqueline, from Singapore's perspective? Is this real? Is this hype? When are we going to see this big bang of the singularity? <laughs> I'm not sure that we are definitely uh, moving along the direction of the singularity. Um, but I'll tell you, it's a singular moment of um, hyperinflated expectations uh, for AI. There was an article in today's Financial Times which I found rather interesting, uh, which stated that the real winners of the AI boom to date have been the management consultants. <laughs> <laughs> and True. this is not. Um, this is, uh, it w that was a very salient point for me. Um, so of course I took that article and I forwarded it to all the management consultants <laughs> I knew who were heavily involved in AI consulting in Singapore. And they said, nay, that is not true. It is the infrastructure guys. <laughs> it's actually NVIDIA where we, our, our, our ROI is just a fraction of what they're making out of this. Um, and I think that both of these things are true. Um, I think we are in the middle of a hype cycle. Uh, most of you who understand the Gartner hype cycle matrix will probably feel it and know that we're in the middle of a hype cycle, uh, which doesn't mean that it isn't real. Mm -hmm. It simply means that some ex expectations are inflated and you have to uh, manage to keep the core of the value uh, you know, uh, throughout the whole process until you get through the trough of the solution, when, uh, until you get to a plateau of productivity and still maintain those capabilities. It's important because we've seen this before. Not just in digital, but in AI itself, it's gone through several of these cycles. But every single time, uh, you know, the technology has improved, it's come back at a higher level and the economies that have preserved those capabilities have done well. I was recently in Canada, um, Toronto, Montreal, and so on, and uh, meeting some of the AI experts in Canada. Canada has really maintained a lot of the institutes and deep tech capabilities uh, in AI, and they've also produced some really great companies like Cohere, who've actually emerged out of this, you know, disciples of, you know, friends of, you know, Yasha Benjo or like Jan Bakun or Jeff Hinton. And I wondered why, you know, they were very successful in managing through these periods of time. And I realized they are called AI winters. Yep. And some places are better at um, working through winter, places with a lot of winter. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the ability to weather a winter. Uh, and it's the ability to have a hibernation mode mm. uh, and to keep your capabilities warm 
during a period of hibernation. I'm not saying that a winter is going to be upon us. I'm saying that you know, for a lot of deep tech subjects, it is important to know when to go out and get funding, uh, when to go into hibernation, and when to preserve fundamental capabilities. Uh, for the current cycle, um, we have apparently 1,100 AI startups in Singapore. Some of them are very advanced. Some of them I'm not sure are AI startups. <laughs> so discernment is going to be of uh, great value in the whole part of this process. Um, even in terms of where the infrastructure boom is taking place for AI with AI data centers, um, discernment is also needed to figure out how well utilized those data centers are. Who is utilizing those data centers? How are you managing power and resources and water? Uh, is this, it, what part are, is more sustainable and which parts are not more sustainable? Which is why I, I go back to our fundamental thesis in Singapore about uh, an AI-driven economy. Because until the moment that businesses find that they can get an ROI out of using um, AI um, and in order to improve their productivity or to create new product, uh, as DBS is doing, or, or SIA, which is another big one that's using this now, uh, um, or you know, any of the other companies. Like even, even in our own stable, we worked with GlaxoSmithKline to find a way to use with the Google and the Google Ignite program, a uh, Google AI Trailblazers program, to actually bring together these companies to actually find value out of uh, an AI implementation in the, manu in the pharma manufacturing sector. And we really like saved 5,000 man hours and so on. So until you, these, these things are, are really scaling in companies, it's hard to see where you know, the, the hype ends and the reality of that productivity starts to take place. It may be some, some have said that you know, in some senses we are at the edge of a revolution where you can only see the deep embedding of the technology within the next five to 10 years. I think you can see, you can measure the outcomes, at least for, for, for our industry, right? And the outcomes that you measure and you quantify will be either loading factors, right? Mm -hmm. per, per human, now how many clients can you cover? It can be the customer number of transactions. It can be the time to market um, and um, uh, or, or how fast uh, a service call is resolved, you know, and, and, and whether you can, uh, it's one call res resolution, that's, that's also a, a, a good measurement. So I think there are a lot of quantifiable, certainly in different industries will have different quanti quantifiable matrix, but um, you can uh, measure them and then refine your models to make them more efficient. And, and building on that, um, Sushan, like the discernment that you need on the quantity of AI models, like what is your approach when, and your experience at DBS yeah. in terms of should you just do a lot of different ones? I mean, how do you measure that? Or how so do you it, it is, um, and, and that's a great question because I think um, no one at the moment, I don't know if everyone really knows the real cost, Jack, to your point, of, 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 of all this generative AI and it's a lot of models, right? So there's the real CapEx cost, the cost you pay to the big tech guys and, and some of these startups. Then there's the adjacencies around energy or water and, and, and other things and then the operating costs. Um, and then the cost of training, you know, new target operating models, etc. So there's a lot of adjacencies that we still don't know. But I think what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to refine the way we measure the successes of each model, as I said, by things like cost income. Overall, you just have to look at your overall business cost income ratio. Mm -hmm. That's your top-down, you know, approach. Then you look at the individual productivity ratios, then you look at the customer returns ratios, right? So you can look at different lenses, your own costs, customer returns, you know, employee productivity, et cetera. So you can dice it up. But in, in, in my experience, number one is get everyone to, to drink the Kool-Aid. That's not always easy. But if you put the, 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 the weapons in, in your, your, your colleagues' hands, so to speak, right? let them own the model, let them own the feedback loop, let them own the outcomes, and let them own both the failures and the successes. You know, that's one important thing, is, is, is ownership, accountability, and being fully aligned through the whole horizontal organization for the outcomes that you're generating, number one. And then get the customer feedback. To me, that's so important, right? If the customer's not telling you what they like and don't like, it's, 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 it's not very useful. 
And my third learning is, you know, it, you don't always have to be the first. Mm. <laughs> Sometimes if you are the first, I mean, I, I will share one failure, I won't mention names, but 2014, we were the first bank, I think, in the world or in Asia to use AI for, for wealth management. I was a wealth management head in those days. And we ended up teaching the model a lot of things. We ended up helping to build the model, and I had to put a lot of resources into it. And, and for a whole year, that's what we did. And the outcomes were not great because LLMs were not that strong in those days. And, and, and my bankers are like, Sushan, this is not working. It's a waste of our time. Stop it. Right? So you also have to know when to say, OK, not working. You turn, right? Kill. Kill switch. <laughs> so <laughs> knowing when to turn on the kill switch is also important. So. Um, I, as I said, right, a lot of this cultural mindset shift is bringing the whole team along, mm. getting the feedback and learning, experimenting, fail, fail fast, move on. I actually do have a perspective on this because um, we are looking at a lot of companies for whose motivations um, might not be the right ones for doing AI projects or implementing AI. Um, we have quite a few companies for, for whom the CEO and the, and the C-suite team are doing it because the board said, you've got to do AI oh. without giving them a path to either scaling or, you know, an, an, or an alternate objective, which is to build capabilities and just you know, learn. So either you're doing it for scaling or you're doing it for learning. But those are two clear objectives, at least you know, um, would be the aims, uh, not my board said I had to do this or else. <laughs> Um, so if you have, and then, so if there aren't those paths, you, there are a lot of POCs that don't end up anywhere uh, because the board didn't also uh, authorize scaling expenditure. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, not having a clear win that is just having, you know, 50 people in your organization really understand this and are ready for the next round then that's also not very helpful. So you can try a learning objective or a scaling objective, but not to have either, and my board that just told me to do this is not a, a great recipe for success. But often it's the people at the coal face who will then tell you, hey, I think this can solve this problem. Right? For some of my team used to say, oh, Sushan, there's so much grunt work in, in, in our admin. Right? Everyone is employee toil. And what's the grunt work? So for example, when we're, secu when we're settling documentary trade, right? there's a, uh, a, a LC, export LC, import LC, then you have to read everything on the trade, make sure the legal documents are fine. And reading legal docs many times over and over again, uh, Right, we all know how grunty that is, right? So much grunt work. So today, the Gen AI, the great thing is it can read, synthesize, summarize, and then tell you, yeah, check, 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 check the box. This document is perfect. Take that out of the human equation. The bot does it, perfect. And the bot does it better than the human in some instances. Great. So the Gen AI can help with a lot of grunt work. Then where it's getting a little bit more scary is when it can generate great pitch books, sometimes better than... <laughs> the intern that came in last summer, right. or better than your youngest analyst, then you have to think, OK, mm, now, if the pitch book generation which used to be done by a human is that good. But you keep the human in the loop to stop the hallucination still. right? We still have to do that. I haven't met any tech that solves for hallucination yet. But if you have that, then you, you think, OK, young analysts, you, know, you don't have to spend hours now. You, you, we used to have investment bankers spend hours overnight sleeping in the office churning out pitch books. Those days are over. Brilliant. So what does the, guy, what does the analyst do? The analyst starts you know, talking to, to, to customers to get a sense of what the customer wants, maybe coming up with ideation. right? And, and, and that's far more creative and far more fun than churning out pitch books. Yeah, so this really means that talent and culture, as you're emphasizing, is so important. Jacqueline, when you're going out there trying to attract the best talent and the best companies, what are we offering to them as Singapore in terms of compute and an environment for AI startups? Yeah, I do think that a lot of AI startups actually have come to Singapore, uh, in, especially in the last uh, two years. Um, and they bring a lot of um, the, the capabilities with them. What we've done is um, try to ensure a couple of things. One is trained personnel. We've committed to training 15,000 AI experts in Singapore over the next few years. And, and actually, that also provides sort of a base load of talent on top of what is already a fairly digital country with quite a bit of digital expertise. 
uh, in the nation. So I think we have some of that. We also offer a tech pass and a one pass, which are visas, which are two years or five years long. Uh, for individuals with specific talents. Um, and the tech pass has been very attractive, especially to um, digital tech talent who are in the AI space. So um, basically, it, it, it is actually something that you know, is quite attractive to a lot of people because they're kind of golden visas uh, for tech talent to come into Singapore, uh, particularly to do AI. There's also quite a lot of funding available. So I mean, we remain the venture capital funding cap you know, hub uh, of um, Southeast Asia and some say Asia. So uh, the money is looking for really good prospects. The money is looking for real implementations, real business models, um, and, and AI companies that can help other companies solve their problems. So the money is going to be there, the talent is going to be there, um, and um, then finally the compute. A few years ago, we had a moratorium on data centers in Singapore in acknowledgement of our, of our climate goals. Uh, and the fact that actually data centers are very, very carbon intensive, AI data centers are particularly carbon intensive and extremely um, energy dense. So uh, recently, we've decided to do a couple of things, one of which is, of course, to uh, lift the moratorium. And we, we issued about 80 megawatts last year. And we made an announcement that we're going to be issuing another 300 megawatts um, in, the, in the next few years. Uh, and that's mainly for very strategic workloads, such as AI. So I think the compute will be available. And you know, uh, we've also worked with our neighbors, Batam, Johor, to ensure that within a low latency, um, sort of environment, um, that the compute is available at a place near Singapore where d data that is maybe less sensitive, maybe not, say, financial sector, can be stored uh, and then be used to inference uh, models uh, for customers in Singapore. So on all, those, and on all those fronts, I think Singapore is really well positioned uh, to, to lead in the AI uh, revolution of the next 10 years. And I think this, this panel kind of really represents the Singapore public-private partnership, this tangle between setting good policy and leaders at the best institutions implementing and executing it with real results. Thank you so much, Sushan and Jacqueline, for your time today.